Welcome to our session, Waka Malware. My name is Amichai Schulman, and I'm honored to share the stage with Stav Schulman. We will be telling you today about very resilient botnets that never die. We'll start our session with a little bit of motivation for our research, and then we'll dive into a short introduction to botnets and how we are fighting them today. Then we will show you the botnets that never die, and we'll talk a little bit about further research and some conclusions. So without further ado, why did we go after botnets? And the reason is that modern cybercrime at scale requires botnets. Whether you want to just DDoS someone or launch a carding attack or a credential stuffing attack or, or even plain SQL injection and you want to do it at scale, you need a functioning botnet. So there are organizations and individuals out there that make a living out of creating those botnets, maintaining them, and either using them for their own operations or renting pieces of them for other people, other organizations for their operations. And it seems that these robust botnets are the key to the success or failure of cybercrime operations. So researchers figured out that neutralizing a botnet is practically destroying the operations. So the question we came up with is, can we build a botnet that survives neutralizing? And can this resilient botnet be cost effective? And of course, the biggest question of all, can the father and daughter relationship survive this joint research? <laughs> so now, in order to begin our journey, I would like to start with giving a bit of background on something that is very near and dear to my heart, malware infrastructures. During my day-to-day -day as a researcher, I happened to stumble upon a very broad range of different threat actors utilizing different malwares and implementing different approaches for CNCs. Generally speaking, I think we can take all of them and divide into three main difficulty level of infrastructure implementations. The very first one is obviously the one that's most basic. And threat actors using this level would rely on domain names. They will have to acquire dedicated domain names or that they can abuse some compromised infrastructure they got access to in order to manually maintain a pool of servers. They will initially deliver these servers inside victims' environments by literally embedding them inside malware binary samples or inside dedicated config files that will come with these malwares. Now, for threat actors that choose this approach, even though it's basic, they still have a little bit of range of motion because they can do things like update their pool of domains from time to time, but they will have to do so by relying on an already known and functioning domain. Now, the second level of difficulty is for threat actors still relying on domain names, but kind of wake up in the morning feeling a tad more creative. And they will usually use DGAs. Now, a domain generation algorithm means that inside the malware, instead of finding a pool of servers, will encounter just one function. And this function will contain a pattern, then a set of prefixes, symbols, and characters that will be used to generate random domain names during the malware's execution, meaning that we can't actually predict which domain is going to be used next. Now, I believe that the most advanced practice that we currently experience in the wild is threat groups that completely ditch the use of these domain names and move forward for utilizing completely publicly available legitimate services and utilities for their malicious infrastructures. 
So we see actors that rely on social media platforms for creating malicious profiles in places like Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to deliver their malicious content using that. We see attackers abuse cloud-based file share services, so things like Google Drive and Dropbox. And we even see a rise of threat groups that take completely legitimate utilities. So things like remote control software that was originally intended for IT personnel, for instance, to tackle fault and incident and abuse its capabilities for full-blown malwares. So we can really see that this usage of the publicly available uh, utilities is on the rise and it's an ongoing trend because we see some of the trendiest stuff like AI powered malwares that rely on the Microsoft Teams platform for channeling their C2 communication. We even see huge malware distributors such as Agent Tesla and Raccoon Stealer that rely on the Discord CDN to deliver malicious payloads. Now that we've covered the means available for threat actors today against us, let's see what we actually as defenders can do against them. So obviously we can and we should identify those resources used by the threat groups. We can analyze any malwares that we get, we can enrich data we've collected, and lastly we should respond and act. How do we even identify those malicious network resources used by threat groups? Well, there are the good old traditional ways. So network anomalies, non-standard ports, large packets, high volume of traffic, and even registration of strange domain names like the greatest Google with a zero. Today, we even have some more advanced practices to do that. So things like EDR alerts, which allows us to see communication inside the context of process execution, which helps us gain some more clever conclusions on what we see. Now, if we're lucky enough, we could have captured the actual malware samples that are associated with this infrastructure we just tracked, the malwares that should connect to it. So when we have a malware sample, we obviously want to analyze it. So we can do anything from the great basic static analysis onto full, very complex reverse engineering, anything that we can do just to see what's inside. And inside of it, we can find additional domains, naming conventions for CNC commands uh, supported by this infrastructure. And in case for DGAs, we can actually extract the algorithm and attempt to predict additional servers in the wild that can match it. Now, naturally, because we are very curious beings, we are researchers after all, we would like to go ahead and enrich on all the data we've just collected. So we can identify domain registration patterns and attempt to find more servers. If we see the use of strange certificates, we can go ahead and search for additional inf infrastructure that use them. And we can attempt to detect additional servers that can support some of the naming conventions for the commands that we've seen or some unique and distinct URI paths or parameter that we've seen on the infrastructure we've just researched. And after doing all of these things, we now just have to act. Now, these days, most of our actions, most of our responses to cybersecurity incidents involving infrastructure um, would consist mainly of IOCs. Now, an IOC for our case can be anything from a file hash, domain name, IP address, URI path, or parameter, or any naming conventions on the server that we found. We can sinkhole malicious infrastructure. So we can attempt to take over completely unprotected C2s, or we can attempt to register domain names used by threat groups. 
in case we have access and we've identified um, accounts used by threat actors. So things like social media profiles, accounts used for Google Drive or Dropbox registration, we can go ahead and get them banned and removed from the platforms. And we can attempt to identify all infected machines in our organizations and clean them up, I guess. Well, everything is nice and dandy. Researchers are winning the battle against botnets uh, because domain registration at scale is still expensive. Uh, it is certainly traceable when you do it on large scale. Um, if you are trying to use accounts on Google or, or Dropbox or other social media, Facebook, Twitter, well, maybe not Twitter, uh, then, then this is still very labor intensive to create the accounts and maintain them because these platforms really try to avoid bot registration and certainly do their best to remove uh, fake accounts from their platforms. And, and once you're confined, for example, to specific domains or specific accounts or folders in Google Docs or whatnot, then, then the traffic can, unique, can be uniquely identified. And then what researchers do is just capture the samples, analyze them, prevent further infections by that same malware sample, and then create IOCs which gets distributed to the security mechanisms out there, be those firewalls, web gateways, so on, that look at the requests coming from the infected machines and block them. And then when the servers themselves are taken down, there is no way for the new control infrastructure created by the attackers. And, and yes, they create the new infrastructure because that's how they make the living. But that new infrastructure cannot communicate with the already infected machines, creating them useless. But researchers are still losing to nation state actors. Those actors have a lot of resources, both in terms of endless budgets and a lot of headcount. And using those resources, they are able to defy gravity by creating huge numbers of, for example, Google accounts or Facebook accounts or LinkedIn accounts and maintaining them over time so they can keep the botnet running for a very long time, even though some of these accounts are being detected and, and now being uh, set up as IOCs in all security mechanisms. Now, that doesn't seem fair for the criminal hackers who do not have budgets and do not have headcounts. So we want to give back power to the people. We want to create abundant infrastructure for your everyday hacker. And of course, it has to rely on public infrastructure, so it should be indistinguishable from normal network traffic. And we want the individual bots to never die, even when the central control infrastructure is taken down. And we want it to be cheap, really cheap. So we started thinking of ways to do that. And here are some of the ways we just crossed out. Blockchain-based infrastructure for botnets. It's possible, but it's very noisy. It's very expensive. Uh, we thought of an infrastructure in which the individual botnet would try to create accounts uh, with a service, like Google, like Facebook. But again, this is complex. This is way too expensive. We talked about how complex it is to create an account with these services. And if you go to off-brand services, think of WeChat, uh, which are easier to register to, uh, they would be identified in any normal network. So let's see if we can do a little bit better. And another idea that we had is to have a single account, a bootstrap account included in the initial malware that would be used by the bot upon registration to receive 
an individual account from a pool that is created in the back office of the botnet control. Okay. And then that individual account would be used for further communications with the infrastructure. Uh, now that provides us with an easy way for two-way communications. Uh, the bots will survive a takedown of the bootstrap account because they already have their individual accounts. They can even survive a takedown of their own individual account by, for example, using a backup account that was created upon registration. However, once the initial malware sample is captured, that bootstrap account would be closed and would not be uh, used anymore. And we will have to replace the initial malware. Uh, account creation, although it's being done in the back office of the uh, botnet controller, it's still a hassle. And what's worse is that researchers could actually attack this infrastructure with an account exhaustion attack. So they would drive the botnet controller crazy with constantly asking for new accounts. Well, we're not happy with that. So we sat down and say, oh, we don't know what to do. And when you do not know what to do, you just Google it. And that was our aha moment, our epiphany, if you'd say. We should build a system in which the bots do not know the CNC. However, the bots know how to search for the CNC, and they know a CNC when they see one. See? And of course, we have to choose our search terms in a way that they cannot be used as IOCs. Think cats, cute, pink. Now that we have an idea on how to become a malware lord, we needed a guide to how to do that. And the guide for becoming a malware lord starts with gather your minions. So what we did is we recruited undergraduate students from the Technion <laughs> and explained the system to them. And the system should be based on a service that supports anonymous data consumption, okay? Uh, so I can consume data without registering an account. It should offer a flexible and diverse search functionality. Pretty much everyone does that today. And content creation in the platform may require registration, but the content itself is not scrutinized. So we gave them these instructions, this specification, and said, go and find platforms, go and create POCs. They created great things. Uh, they used YouTube, they used Reddit, um, they relied on comments on content posted by other people. And uh, really within the time frame of a single semester, we're able to come with POCs on top of these platforms. In the meanwhile, we took a different platform, which we'll show you today. So now I am really thrilled to introduce you with the POC that we've executed, SpotBot which obviously is a bot communicating over Spotify infrastructure. Now, why we specifically chose Spotify for this demonstration was really a no-brainer. It's because Spotify is just the perfect match to all the criteria we've mentioned and said that is absolutely crucial for the success of this infrastructure. All types of media that are available on Spotify can be consumed anonymously. Spotify also offers a great abundance of search terms and modifiers to be performed on said media anonymously. And the most important thing when creating and hosting a malware infrastructure is that for Spotify podcasts, all data is not scrutinized in any way, nor for 
copyrights or for offensive content. So if you've ever found yourself wondering of how can one start its own Spotify podcast, then wonder no more. Because delivering podcasts via Spotify is relatively easy. All you have to do is register to a thing called a content distribution platform. We've used one that's named Castos and it costs less than $20 a month, which is quite cheap. And then into this platform, you upload your podcast's content. So episodes, images, titles, transcripts, and descriptions. Then simply go to podcasters.spotify.com, link it with this distribution platform, and congratulations, you now own a podcast. Now that we have a brand new podcast that is live and on the air, let's see how we can actually utilize it to send CNC commands. And so the first approach we can take here is to encode data inside the podcast's audio streams or the images that are associated with it. And to do that, we'll have to encode and then decode the data on the other end using something like an OCR or an OG modulation program. Now, the second approach that we chose is to encode short data messages inside podcast episodes descriptions. Now, you'll be surprised with how much you can fit inside just one description. So for instance, we can put their short, short commands, we can put URLs for fetching further payloads, we can insert the ID of an additional Spotify object in our malicious chain, and we can even fit a 64 by DSA digital signature inside the description. Now that we covered how the SpotBots controller side can look like and can operate, let's see how the SpotBots client, so the victims themselves, can create their initial contact with the Spotify C2. And to do that, we'll rely on those search terms we've mentioned earlier. It's because each SpotBot distribution will be packaged with a set of keywords referring to the malicious podcast name. Upon initial execution, SpotBot will search Spotify for these keywords, receiving back many, many results, including podcast episodes, songs, playlists, artists, and essentially anything available on the platform that can match either of the keywords. Poor SpotBot now has to determine which of these results is the right one. And to do that, he will attempt to match the description of all of the results with an additional set of either keywords or patterns that are embedded inside the malware. Now, the right episode with the right description shouldn't only match SpotBot's keywords and patterns, but must also match SpotBot's digital signature, because we've said that we can fit one inside the malicious description. Now, using the signature helps SpotBot verify that it got the right content, while also helping us make sure that our infrastructure and our bots are not being sinkholed. So as you can see inside the description, we can put things like commands to be executed on the victim's host machine, or that we can put there the ID of an additional episode of our podcast that will eventually lead SpotBot to things it has to execute. Now let's all assume for a moment that the absolute worst of all had happened, and a researcher happened to track down the links to all of our episodes, blocking them, even getting them removed from Spotify in an attempt to defeat us and disable all the bots. Well, in this case, we'll just simply upload new and fresh content into Spotify because we're still aware of the keywords that are embedded inside SpotBot's distributions and SpotBots will forever continue to look up their keywords in case they received no additional command, leaving us and a researcher playing a very vicious game of Waka Malware with Spotify content and SpotBots reviving. 
Now, we want to present just a quick demo of how SpotBot's execution can actually look like. So on this side, you can see the console output of a SpotBot's execution. So what a bot is doing, what is he looking for in Spotify, what did he find and attempting to do next. And on this side, you can see the actual content on Spotify that the bot is consuming. So we can see that the bot is attempting to start <laughs> and is not starting. So that's I'll great. simulate the bot. <laughs> <laughs> He's um, not working. <laughs> so it was evident that we could easily create a running, functioning botnet infrastructure on top of various platforms in a very minimal cost. Um, and it was easy to deliver commands from the controller to the bots on this infrastructure. But as you've noticed, it's not that trivial to do the other way around. So of course, we could use some of the commands to, for example, include temporary links or URLs to servers that we've taken over and can now be used for a limited time by the bots to upload their content. But this is still somewhat inconvenient. Uh, so in terms of further research, we've tried to find a way to make this channel bidirectional. Uh, one of the methods we thought of was looking into the analytics that the platforms offer. Think of YouTube analytics, who's watching the movie, where are they coming from, and so on, who's listening to my music and podcast on Spotify. And what we tried to do was to insert information into HTTP headers, for example, in a way that would show up in the analytics uh, screens. Um, alas, we're not very successful with that. Uh, there was anecdotally one thing we were able to do with YouTube, so we were able to see which language a movie was consumed in. So we could have different bots trying to ask for different language versions of the uh, podcast, for example, or of a movie, and, and, and then you know, track them a little bit, but not a lot of information could be uh, sent that way. Uh, so that's, that's certainly one area that uh, deserves further research. Another idea that we looked into was instead of the bots searching for their controller, have the controller find the bots. And the best infrastructure for doing that is ads-based botnets. Think about all those services that just know that you're planning a trip to Kenya, or all those advertisers that just happen to know that you are talking about a new car you want to purchase, okay? So these are very powerful platforms in terms of uh, targeting machines, targeting individuals. Uh, so definitely an idea to look at. And of course, one of the most obvious ones that deserves attention is how can we use existing accounts on the inflect infected platforms to communicate with our botnet infrastructure? So I think that we've proved that many public platforms provide the opportunity for attackers to create a very resilient botnet that never dies. And all these platforms can be easily put to work because of their APIs, because of their simple web access. So the cost of maintaining this infrastructure alive is dramatically dropping. Not only that, because you are not losing the individual bots when 
you're being detected at one place, it becomes even more cost effective. So what's the conclusion of all this? The conclusion is that the current Defender toolbox is no longer doing the work and it must change. The generic defenses that are based on IOCs applied to the traffic going out of the boats to the controller just fail to protect us. And we got to the point where you can achieve cheap and simple construction of these botnets. However, it's a very expensive and complex process to dismantle them. And it seems like we need a new breed of tools here that are able to look at the content delivered by the platforms and at the same time be somewhat platform agnostic. And until we have this breed of tools, we'll keep losing the game of Waka Malware. Thank you. Thank you.